So, uh, to get us underway, um, I'm delighted uh, to introduce our first keynote speaker. As RSEs, the work we do can often have impact in the wider world. Uh, during the last few years, there have been countless examples of RSEs contributing to the international response to the COVID-19 pandemic and its effects on our societies. Professor Neil Ferguson is an epidemiologist and professor of mathematical biology, specializing in the spread of infectious disease. His major research interests have been the development of mathematical models of the geographic spread of newly emergent pathogens, including foot and mouth disease, SARS and MERS, pandemic influenza, Ebola and Zika. He played an important role in the UK's response to the COVID-19 pandemic, participating in SAGE, the Scientific Advisory Group for Emergencies, and numerous other advisory groups. Professor Ferguson is going to talk to us today about the work done by his research team, sharing insights into the computational modeling of infectious disease, analysis and optimization and intervention strategies, and how they inform public policy. Please welcome Professor Neil Ferguson. Thank you very much, and thank, it's a pleasure to be here. And thank you for the invitation. I think everybody can see that. Um, so I'm going to mostly not talk about software engineering, though I will mention a little bit about our RSE team. I'm going to largely um, give a little review of you know, what epidemiological modeling is, talk a bit about our work on the early pandemic, which really um, set the stage for control measures which came later and, and really gave the original risk assessment of the threat posed to the world by the, uh, this new virus. Um, it'll be a little bit more techy on the analytical pipelines uh, bit. A lot of the analyses we did, we had to, particularly for the UK, but also globally, we had to repeat, you know, not, if not every day, then every few days, every week, uh, with very large amounts of data coming in, and, and that was an engineering effort. I'll briefly touch on 2021 variants and vaccines, though I wouldn't say an enormous amount of that work and, and sum up with some lessons learned. But a little bit about epidemiological modeling. This is my colleague, Stephen Riley, who is now head of um, data analytics at the UK Health Security Agency. Um, the goals of the sort of modeling I do and, and the team does at Imperial um, are, are twofold. You can, you can sort of categorize it in, in a number of different ways. But one way is, is thinking about, are you looking back in time, in which case you're trying to learn things about things already observed, about past trends, estimate parameters which are governing transmission of a pathogen, such as the transmissibility, how different variants differ, quite importantly from the point of view of, of assessing what response is needed, assessing the severity, and then looking at, based on data from the ground and what's been done, how effective different interventions are. And generally, this work has been uh, less controversial in the pandemic. Um, uh, though there have been, on, on the right, some, some criticisms of, for instance, assessments of severity or, or assessments of intervention efficacy. Then the other sort of work, which is a minority of what we do, but important for policymakers, is, is um, prospective modeling. So that's basically trying to make it some assessment of the future. That can be statistical, short-term projections, or it can be um, a risk assessment of what's coming up next. And often it involves what's called counterfactual scenario modeling, making some assumption about what might happen in the future um, under a range of different intervention scenarios and, and then looking at the potential model outcomes. It tends to be fairly easy to criticize because you can never quite guess what is going to happen next, particularly when in, in an emerging epidemic where behavior is not necessarily predictable, not, neither is the precise impact of interventions. But nevertheless, I would argue it's been invaluable for policymakers around the world. And we've done large amounts of work in both of those areas in, and quite a lot which straddle the two boundaries. If you think about epidemiological models, I mean, you're modeling a very complex system and, and epidemics behave, are, are fundamentally nonlinear processes. We're trying to integrate data from a variety of sources on the, what's called the natural history of a disease, its evolution over time, and then data on the potential impact of things like interventions. And of course, diseases spread within populations, and so you're wanting to capture something about the demography and the population structure, the contact patterns within that host population. And then coming out of the other end, we want to scientifically get an insight into the mechanisms driving spread of different diseases and the patterns, you know, the drivers can be quite different. We're working, for instance, on monkeypox nowadays, a very different pathogen 
from COVID-19. Um, and then estimates of these fundamental epidemiological parameters. And then that allows you to think about making projections into the future or assessing policy options. Associated with all of that work is uncertainty. And this is just a, a, a ab, you know, <coughs> abstracted view of how you can view uncertainty when you're working on a emerging infectious disease. Along the um, horizontal axis is when you're doing an analysis. Along the vertical axis is whether you're looking backwards in time or forwards in time. Clearly, if you're trying to make projections about the future early in a pandemic, you have relatively little information and you have to typically extrapolate from other diseases, uncertainty is high. If you're looking, as we're doing now, looking back on the pandemic with enormous amounts of data, trying to assess what happened, what could be done better, we have much less uncertainty. And then we have different types of models. Um, first of all, a lot of what we do is not you know, simulations of epidemics. It's statistical analysis um, in a re from simple regression models to you know, survival analysis um, on, on the, you know, for instance, the outcomes of, of infection in different patient groups. Um, that can be complex, um, sometimes computationally intensive, but is actually probably the, the backbone of, of what we do have done throughout the pandemic. It tends to be less high profile, but important for understanding what is going on. And then we have move on to things where you're actually simulating something about transmission. And a lot, again, a lot of what we do there is inferential, it's statistical, it's fitting models to data. And I'll give an example later, a package called Epidemia we developed to do that. These tend to be quasi, what I call quasi-mechanistic models. They're quite simple and they can be applied in real time quite quickly. And then finally, they're the full-blown kind of dynamical epidemic simulations Simpler compartmental models make up about 90% of what we do, and then we use agent-based models and microsimulations for a small proportion of the rest. And so there is no one imperial model. We have developed over the course of the pandemic a whole range of different uh, models, all of them open source, which uh, I won't list here. I'll talk about a few of them later, which fall into those different categories. Um, uh, and then there have some commonality. We try to be consistent in the use of parameter estimates across all the modeling tools, but they were developed separately because they address different needs, um, different, th and I'll, I'll try and explain that as I go on. Uh, underpinning a lot of this is our, uh, and it's constantly changing um, range of faces, is our nine, I think, 10 strong research software engineering group in the MRC center I currently head, uh, which is headed by Rich Fitzjohn, many of, hopefully many of you, whom you will know. Um, uh, and we really prioritized investment in developing RSC from about 2014, the second term of, of the center. Um, initially to support a very large project we host called the Vaccine Impact Modeling Consortium, but also because we identified a, a growing need for, first of all, more rigorous software engineering overall, but for being better at reusing software, developing generic modeling libraries, and because of the push towards reproducible open science. The group also has done a lot to improve the technical skills of, of the researchers in the center. It's about 250 of us uh, in terms of providing bespoke training as well. So now I'll switch to the actual pandemic and some of the science and talk about the kind of early work between about January and March 2020, which really drove a lot of policy. And we have some common questions we address with every new emerging disease, and they tend to be of this type. You know, what's the true scale of the epidemic? Because we know typically diseases are underreported in their first few weeks and months. How fast is it spreading? How transmissible it is? How much of a threat does it pose? And that's typically about, you know, what proportion of people need to be hospitalized and are dying. And then finally, what might we do about it? And so we addressed those questions in turn our first very early analysis, which got a lot of publicity, but is a very simple analysis, was just looking at the epidemic in Wuhan. By 16th of January 2020, there'd been 41 cases reported and two deaths, but there'd also been three international cases, two in Thailand and one in Japan. And we realized, well, I realized, you know, listening to the news that morning, that that implied there had to be very significant underreporting of the level of infection 
in Wuhan, because you can look at flight data and demographic data and do quite a simple calculation, which gives you an estimate that roughly there's a one in 600 ch chance that somebody would have flown out, in a case would have flown out of Wuhan, um, given its population size, given the number of people flying out of that city per day. And so even assuming surveillance in Japan and Thailand was perfect, you would have to multiply those three international cases by 600 to get an estimate of the true epidemic size. And that's effectively our first analysis. And we looked at a range of scenarios and we're coming up with numbers, all of which typically in the central estimates were above 1,000. Um, and that was immediately highly concerning because it becomes much less plausible. This is just spillover, as we call it, from an animal source for the virus becomes much more likely what we're seeing is a fast-growing human epidemic. And certainly, when, as we updated this analysis, it got more sophisticated, and I should say other groups did similar analyses. We were estimating of the order of 110,000 symptomatic cases by about 3rd of February. You can then take that sort of analysis and go back, we're using genetic and other data, to estimate when the epidemic started to get some sense of epidemic growth. And this was our initial estimate of the transmissibility of this virus, the so-called R number, which I barely need to define nowadays giving talks, um, number of secondary cases per case, um, which we were coming up with estimates with a lot of uncertainty of the range 1.5 to 3.5 from this very simple heuristic analysis. We then got some access through WHO to early data from Wuhan. Um, uh, and this is the case curve as of 29th of January. So it's dropping off at the end, not because the disease is controlled at that point, just because of reporting delays. But again, you actually see reported cases by date of onset. And then you can use more established statistical tools we've developed um, to estimate in blue here what the reproduction number is. And again, it's falling in that range here about two to four, which is concerningly high. It's higher than pandemic influenza, for instance. And finally, and by far the most difficult analysis we did early on, we tried to assess the severity of this infection. And the reason it's difficult, which is defined by the infection fatality ratio, proportion who die from infection, it's difficult to estimate, partly because you have a fast growing, ex exponentially growing epidemic, and there are long delays from when somebody gets infected to when they die. And those delays mean you can't just divide reported deaths to date by reported cases to date. But beyond that, we knew that there were very significant um, surveillance biases. China did not have an infinite number of tests at that point, and so they were basically only testing people with severe disease. It's much harder to estimate the bottom of this, um, what's called surveillance pyramid of people who had from mild symptoms or asymptomatic. And that's what we did with, I mean, by actually using some data on, on infection prevalence, proportion of people infected in Wuhan, which was gained from a testing of, of foreigners coming out of Wuhan on repatriation flights. You remember people were repatriated to Japan, to the Western, Western countries, and everybody was tested on those flights. And we got point estimates of prevalence to allow us to make that, that estimate. And, and so initially we estimated for for China, and there was about two-fold uncertainty either side of this number, that the infection fatality ra ratio was about 0.7%. But, and what the graphs on the right-hand side show is how that varies with age, linear scale on the top and log scale on the bottom. And this is actually estimates from much later data collected from a number of countries. But what you see is that the risk of death increases exponentially with age, a characteristic of this virus. Um, and, and what that meant is that in older populations, like the UK, like Italy, like a number of European countries, we would expect the disease to be, on average, more lethal. We have more old people. Beyond that, working with colleagues from Oxford, uh, London School, and the NHS, we also made an assessment at the same time of what the hospital demands would be for this um, virus, which would be about three times higher than um, the, the estimated infection fatality ratio. And those numbers really have held up over time. But I would caveat that we got much better at treating the virus over time. So after the initial first wave, new treatments came on, which substantially reduced that death rate. So that left us with assessing you know, what 
might be done. And I show you what might be done. I mean, it wasn't our, our job to determine what would be done. Given that we had no drugs or vaccines initially, and, and only social distancing, basically, in case isolation, standard non-pharmaceutical interventions, and applying those at scale were, was inevitably going to be economically costly. And we could see what was happening in China, and then later, what happened in northern Italy. So the key strategic question for all the countries in the world really was, were they going to follow China and, and suppress transmission with intensive uh, non-pharmaceutical interventions, or just what was later called flatten the curve, mitigate only. So not attempt to stop spread, but attempt to protect the elderly, for instance, and flatten the curve enough that maybe the health system could cope. And in a range of work done by ourselves, the London School, and a number of groups worldwide, um, the consensus conclusion was that if, if we just went for mitigation, that we would still see an overwhelming um, level of healthcare demand, which would overwhelm the NHS. And to be honest, before the pandemic, that had always been recognized, and in this sort of emergency, that was the default plan. But it clearly, as we saw emerge in the pandemic, became politically unacceptable to let that happen um, this time. And so the decision to initially lock down, and of course the whole of Europe locked down within a week of uh, each other, um, was driven by that concern about healthcare demand. And unfortunately, some countries of the world, thinking of, for instance, India and Mexico uh, and some areas of Brazil, um, did see that overwhelming peak when they lifted measures later that year. At the same time, around March of 2020, we were doing some global projections. Um, so not just modeling the UK, but modeling every country in the world. And we were making projections that if nothing was happen, which was always an extreme counterfactual, then we might see 40 million deaths. If we just went, the world went for what's called mitigation, we might see, and we could halve that to 20 million. Suppression could do better than that, but would be challenging and would always be challenging because it's a measure which has to be maintained in place on and off um, until um, vaccine becomes available. An important conclusion of that early work was that um, low-income countries, which tend to have younger populations, as shown on the, on the right-hand side here, would actually see a lower burden of disease just because their populations were much younger. And indeed, we have seen that, uh, that happen. With the exception of South Africa, which has an older population, most of sub-Saharan Africa has seen relatively low mortality. The challenge with adopting suppression measures, though, is that um, in an exponentially growing epidemic, um, timing becomes critical. Every, if, a, if an epidemic is doubling every, let us say, four days, then every four-day delay leads to twice as many cases before the epidemic starts being pulled down, and therefore double, you know, double the number of, um, uh, of deaths as well. And so we've done this more formally, but in the UK context, um, had we acted all the control measures, and it was staged, I should say, it wasn't just like we immediately went to lockdown, there was a kind of one week period of escalating measures, but had everything been done a week earlier, then we'd probably have seen only 15,000 deaths in the first wave rather than 37,000. A week later, we might have seen 100,000 deaths. This is not a criticism, it's just a reflection on the, um, the dynamics of the epidemic at that stage. And just bear in mind that that 37,000 deaths is only less than 25% of the now 170,000 deaths the UK has seen. We always projected, and this is from report nine, but that multiple lockdowns would be needed. And the reason for that is that they only work when the measures are in place. As soon as you lift those measures and let people contact each other again in society, you expect transmission to rebound, which is fine, but you just have to then respond in a timely manner once infections get to too high a level to suppress it again. We, of course, modeled this as algorithmically, rationally driven based on hospital <laughs> demand. What actually happened was a little bit more complex than that. Um, this is uh, deaths across Europe. Um, through to early 2021, plotted on a log scale just to show it, um, see a similar pattern across many European countries where um, you see that first wave, bear in mind these are deaths, so slightly lagged, it takes a while for deaths to come down after, after measures are introduced. Europe locked down, introduced at least um, 
quite strict social distancing measures, and then those measures were gradually lifted. We saw a rebound in cases, but governments acted across Europe, acted slowly to respond, um, despite, in my view, the fairly clear science on what was going on and what was needed. Why was that? Well, the economic and social impacts of the control measures which had been introduced in March uh, 2020 were now much more apparent to the entire population of, of Europe. Um, there was a lot of noise in the popular discourse in terms of a potential trade-off between the economy and health, for instance, more downright skepticism of the science. And there was a hope, if you remember, we invested enormous amounts of money in a test and trace system. Korea had shown, Vietnam had shown those sort of systems could, to some degree, suppress transmission. There was a hope that maybe our system could too. So a variety of factors influenced the slow response. The unfortunate consequence, though, is that 75% basically of the deaths we've seen in the UK in the pandemic happened after 1st of September 2020. The first wave is a small proportion of the, of the total. And unfortunately, other countries in Europe, the Netherlands, responded more quickly, saw half as many deaths per capita. Denmark, even better, saw roughly a quarter of the deaths per capita. So we we're not in the worst position in Europe, but certainly not in the best. I'll switch now and talk a little bit about analytical pipelines. Throughout this period, I mean, from about March onwards, once surveillance was actually set, systematic surveillance was set up in the UK, we were getting data dumps along with other groups around the country every day of increasing size and complexity of, of individual line lists of cases, hospitalizations, deaths, together with data from serological surveys, then the infection prevalence surveys, ONS and, and, and REACT, and then later genetic data on, on new variants. And finally, a list of everybody in the country who'd been vaccinated. As you'd be pleased to know, not with any names attached to any of this. Um, uh, and then every week, we would be generating, and er faster than that, early in the pandemic, we'd be estimating the reproduction number, generating projections, evaluating numerous different policy options and doing a lot of other bespoke analyses for the government. And so it was essential that we had a, a pipeline which could be run reliably again and again and was generated reproducible results such that we could go back and exactly reproduce what had been done at any time point. And so, um, and Rich is most the, uh, Rich Fitzjohn is most the key author of this. We had this suite orderly which had been developed earlier to do exactly that within our framework, and, and that was used throughout um, the pandemic. I'll talk mostly about the UK modeling, which, which was generally the most complex because we had so many data streams to integrate. We had parallel analysis, slightly simpler for, for global work, and we developed a package to COVID, again in our package, which was really in continuous development from February 2020. And, and what you see there is really how the model represents um, clinical care pathways for, for people infected with COVID. Um, it's coded in, again in a package developed by, by Rich Odin, which allows for high performance um, solving of the differential equations or stochastic um, state models, uh, state space models within R. Basically, it's a meta language, which comp I'll come on to it in a moment, compiles um, simple code into, into C. And that was fitted to the data streams using quite computationally intensive methods, particle filter and particle MCMC algorithms, which were highly parallelized. And that was all put together in the kind of Sir COVID package, the little a uh, shout out to Odin, it's a kind of domain specific language. Looks like if anybody remembers Berkeley Madonna, it looks like uh, Berkeley Madonna. Um, uh, and it compiles in the background into C uh, and therefore is, is highly performant. Um, that initial single monolithic package though rapidly became too complex to continue to develop and so it was split up uh, and refactored in about mid-2020 into a number of separate packages, which are much more general and are being used for a range of applications going forward. Um, things for efficient evaluation of state space, stochastic state space models, um, and then a specific version of Odin designed to allow you to rapidly develop those models, and then a more, much more generic uh, inferential tool for allowing those models to be fitted to data. And so this, this tool has been used 
it's been a mainstay of our UK analyses since about um, April 2020 onwards. This gives an example of the sort of policy work we did with it. So it's fitted to, this is daily, uh, lots of data sources, but I'm showing daily deaths. This is work done in October 2020 for SAGE, which looks at the potential impact of a second one month circuit breaker lockdown with schools being open. Now we couldn't, because schools were gonna be open, we couldn't precisely predict the effect of that, so the different colors represent different scenarios for effectiveness. And then we also modeled um, the potential additional impact of a January 2021 lockdown. And you'll see from the height of those curves where they reached without the January 2021 lockdown, we, that we were anticipating under any circumstances we'd most likely need a third lockdown in January 2021. Reality, of course, differed from these scenarios. We didn't realize that at that time, alpha, the alpha variant was starting to spread in the UK. And that, of course, made the situation even worse. In parallel, we've been doing a lot of work, parallel work for low and middle income countries using the Squire framework, which is analogous to Sir COVID, though a little simpler because data sources are more limited. Um, and that has been used to both estimate you know, transmission intensity every week throughout the, for every country in the world uh, and putting out reports. And this work was funded by DFID and the Wellcome Trust. Together with partnering, we of course couldn't, didn't have the resource to partner with every country, but doing direct bilateral support of, of policymakers in a number of countries around the world. And then later we made a user-friendly version, that doesn't work anymore I should say, but um, um, uh, of, of this modeling tool to allow policymakers around the world to look at different intervention options. And so, this, the you know, dashboard tool will produce estimates of, of the true size of the epidemic for many countries based on numbers of reported deaths and assessment of underreporting. A challenge in many low-income countries was the very limited availability of testing, so we knew that very few um, infections were actually being detected. And then we did a whole range of other work, I'll shout out Epidemia, which does work and is, is available, on much more detailed weekly assessments of local trends in the UK at, at LTLA level. Um, this package actually was originally developed to estimate the effect of non-pharmaceutical interventions. It's an intervention, it's an inferential package which basically just estimates the reproduction number for mortality in case data, reproduction number over time. And then what Sam Bat, Axel Gandhi and colleagues did was correlate changes in R over time in different European countries with the interventions which have been put in place. And that get, led, um, allowed us to assess the potential impact of different types of social distancing. The more definitive analysis of this is has been published in Science in late 2020 by a group in Oxford uh, in collaboration with ourselves. Really what that showed, and it was a more nuanced analysis of the effect of social distancing, was that the, the net effect of, some, for instance, a lockdown is the sum of individual reductions in contacts in different settings. So I'd say this epidemia package was then, because it's relatively lightweight, was then able to be applied to tracking how across, particularly in the autumn of 2020, where there was a lot of heterogeneity, you remember the tier system of controls which was adopted in the UK, a lot of heterogeneity in what was happening with the pandemic then, allowed us to look at you know, that local variation, producing detailed dashboards for every local authority in the country. Again, quite a computationally intensive pipeline which made use of many of the same tools I've talked about earlier. Moving quickly on to 2021, of course, 2021 was the year of two things. Variants, the B117, they later called Alpha Variant, which ruined all our Christmas is in, in the end of 2020. And then, um, on a more positive note, the rollout of vaccination. Modeling got a lot harder um, for this pandemic because of those two things. I mean, it was always hard in the sense of we're never been quite able to predict the effect of behavioral change in populations and, and not knowing in advance how effective different interventions would be. But it's easier when it's a new virus which doesn't show much genetic diversity spreading in what we call an immunologically naive population without much immunity. But with naturally acquired immunity as the infection levels got higher, 
and with the new var uh, variants coming in, which, which were more transmissible and showed different immunological properties, and with vaccination boosting immunity of the population, it becomes a lot more difficult. The, the, the fancy graph on the right-hand side is from the Next Train website, which nicely tracks new variants of, of COVID. And so I'm not going to talk about this work. I don't have time, but a lot of the work we have done from, from really late 2020 onwards has been characterizing the epidemiological properties of new variants. And, and we were one of the groups to publish the first analysis of the alpha variant. Uh, we did the first analysis of, of the severity of the Omicron variant as well in late 2021. Giving you an example of, of the sort of policy modeling we did for the UK in that um, uh, work, we were one of three academic groups in the UK who led on modeling the roadmap out of lockdown for government. If you remember the road, step one, step two, step three, step four. Um, we, and, and that's modeling based on the same model I talked about earlier, but now modeling you know, the impact of vaccine rollout and, and putting in data on what we knew about the new alpha variant and then later Delta. Um, and when Delta came in, and looking at the potential impact of lifting interventions or relaxing lockdown in a stage sort of way. Again, not being possible to precisely predict what the impact of every stage would be. We don't have enough data. But trying to get at the aim of, of balancing increasing immunity in the population, which is a good thing, against increasing contact rates, which from an epidemiological perspective is a bad thing. And the, the outcome of this modeling was that, first of all, we couldn't predict precisely, but that we needed to have a staged approach, a staggered approach where we evaluated the effect of every relaxation. And that also bought time for increasing vaccine coverage. Where are we now, a year later? Um, well, what we've seen is, um, and this shows across the whole pandemic, hospitalizations and deaths in England, this is specifically from the UK dashboard, <laughs> We see the first wave and then the second wave, even worse than the first wave. And then we see what happened in 2021, which was, you'll notice there's a difference between the hospitalizations and deaths going forward. And that's partly the impact of, of vaccination, which was huge. Secondly, we go into 2022, it's the effect of Omicron. So if I were to show you infections behind that, almost everybody in the country has been infected with an Omicron variant. But we assessed, as did a South African group, that it was about 75% less likely to kill you than Delta, the previous variant. And that was, I mean, a hugely good thing. Still, people can get hospitalized, but they tend to be relatively mildly ill compared with the past. But we have seen continuing waves of infection. We saw the original Omicron wave, which you can see in January 2022, followed by a BA2 wave, and we're just coming out of another what's called BA4 stroke 5 wave. And that is likely to continue. The good news is, though, that it, the burden of disease is at much more manageable levels. So just reflecting a bit, looking back on the pandemic, um, first of all, let's revisit those. I mean, it weren't really predictions, but projections of what possibly might happen over the course of the first two years of the pandemic we made in March 2020. Well, there have been about, that's actually out of date, 6.7 million reported COVID-19 deaths to date. That's people who've actually been lab tested. But excess deaths, how many more deaths happened in those two years than we might have expected statistically from trends in the past, were about three times higher. There have been three sets of estimates published of deaths up to the end of 2022 from the beginning of 2020, uh, 2021, from the beginning of 2020, by The Economist, which actually I think is probably the best estimate, strangely enough, but IHME, a group in uh, the United States, and then official World Health Organization estimates. And basically they range from about 15 million to 20 million um, excess deaths. More deaths in the world happened in, during the pandemic years than we might have expected otherwise. So those numbers are actually in the same ballpark as our 20 million from March 2020. But of course, reality didn't match what the situation we modeled, as, as is always the case. For instance, we, weren't, we didn't include the effects of vaccination. I'll come on to the next slide to talk about how many lives vaccination saved. But we also didn't model vet new variants. And, and the alpha and delta variant account for most of the deaths in the pandemic. And also, we that 20 million was assuming the world mitigated the pandemic. 
In fact, the whole mix of measures were adopted. Nearly the whole world locked down initially, and then a lot of countries in the world couldn't sustain measures and basically let the epidemic spread, not completely unrestrained, but move to a mitigation-type strategy. This is work we published earlier this year, uh, which got a lot of publicity where, and it's always difficult to do, because you, what is the counterfactual of not having vaccine? Would we have carried in, on in lockdown? Would we have let the virus uh, rip? We use a kind of intermediate counterfactual, but um, a, at a fairly conservative estimate, we think that um, of the order of, of um, 17 to 19 million people have lives have been saved through the use and rollout of COVID vaccination. And I re I'd refer you to the paper. I don't have time to go into the details, but it, it, it's a nice analysis. I didn't lead this one. As we look back, and nearly all the modelers in the UK who contributed the UK response received letters from the public inquiry last week asking us to start collating evidence and, and of, of what we've done. But as we look back, I think we need to be careful not to take too insular a perspective. We need to look outside our borders. And so this is just COVID reported COVID-19 deaths, not excess deaths, per million up to February of this year, comparing across mostly European countries. And you see an enormous range. The UK is about in the middle of the pack. Most Eastern European countries in the EU did considerably worse than us. And that's not because of the first wave, that's because they were unable to sustain measures in the second wave and saw really catastrophic uh, mortality. And the excess mortality in places like Bulgaria is actually twice that number, uh, um, re really uh, terrible. Um, many countries did better than us. Uh, and I think I wouldn't prejudge exactly why that is, um, but I think it does require a research agenda and careful look at the interface between science and policy in different countries to assess exactly what happened. Health systems also, of course, differ quite a lot across Europe. And so we're doing quite a lot of that work now, but I'd encourage um, also in public inquiries, of which there are many across Europe, to look beyond their borders as well. In terms of um, lessons for the RSE community, um, we still saw that the big groups around the world basically developed their own models of the epidemic, and there wasn't a lot of reuse of models between different groups. There are some exceptions to that with simpler tools. So um, we have a package called EpiEstim we developed many years ago and have continued to develop, and other groups around the world have developed simpler tools, and those were much more used by public health policy makers. But still, there's a job to do in terms of getting a, a, a base of software that other groups are comfortable to use. There was real enthusiasm from web-based graphical tools by public health professionals. We developed one, but they are, comp I mean, they're resource intensive to develop, particularly in a crisis in real time. We, we've been um, leading on open source research code for many years, but I mean, the pandemic has undoubtedly accelerated that trend. Reproducibility has also um, uh, been a priority, um, particularly in the UK throughout the pandemic. Different groups have adopted different approaches. Um, some have focused on containerization, which is good, if a little computationally intensive. And uh, we, we have used this orderly platform and other comparable platforms to achieve reproducibility. Um, increasingly, we're developing a kind of what I would call a middleware suite for dynamical modeling and model-based inference for which is pl applicable outside epidemiology for nonlinear dynamical models. And I think that trend will continue, um, particularly if you're wanting to make best use of paralyzed hardware and GPUs. It is not practical for every postdoc to develop such code from scratch. And so, I mean, there's increasing traction in that area. And one of the lessons, and we, we'd learned that before the pandemic, but I think better understood across the community, uh, infectious disease modeling and epidemiology community, is that having your own RSC team improves coding practices overall in terms of just simple use of version control, for instance, but also modularity of software, package development, unit testing, focusing on API-based um, approaches. But there are some trade-offs. Um, Rapid analysis modeling, which you have to conduct in 48 hours, for instance, developing code from scratch, a lot of those practices are not agile enough to you know, fulfill that situation. 
And a lot of the analyses we do are bespoke. They're one-off analyses of a particular problem, a particular set of data. It's not necessarily worth the investment in terms of research software engineering to get a gold-plated solution, code solution, to those particular problems. My last slide, just a few more general reflections. Why did we do badly early on? And UK was not unique in this, and probably the single biggest reason, you can blame politicians, but the single biggest reason was lack of situational awareness. We grossly underestimated the level of infection which was in the country, and that's because we didn't start testing systematic surveillance early enough. We'd always estimated ourselves and London School and other groups that there would be many more infections than were being reported in February 2021, but the magnitude of that gap was much larger than we anticipated because infections flood, flooded into the country from Europe in the half-term week of, of um, the spring of, uh, of 2020. Small, another key lesson is that small, if you're going to adopt suppression policy, small differences in the timing of, of lockdowns or, or similar types of measures make a big difference in terms of final outcome. A more general thing, and some of the, uh, you, from the pictures you see, is uh, it hasn't always been pleasant to be a scientist ca caught up in this pandemic. Um, we've seen, you know, it's worse in the United States, I would say, worse in some other European countries, but still we've seen um, signs caught up in rapidly, I mean, just the trend towards populist polarized politics. And I could give a different lecture on that. Um, so where I think that had a very negative impact was in the delay in responding to the second wave. And it wasn't just true in the UK, it's not a criticism particularly of, of the outcoming, outgoing, now outgoing government. Um, it was seen across the board, for, and it's a multifactorial response, but certainly the kind of lockdown skeptics did not help matters. Um, so whilst the second wave was predicted, we all, you know, all the epidemiologists said it was going to happen when we lifted lockdown measures, um, Maybe it wasn't easily, for human reasons, avoidable. I haven't had time to go into the details, but a really genetic surveillance, which the UK has really led the world in, sequencing more viruses per capita than any other country in the world, apart from, I think, Denmark, um, uh, has been critical for understanding what new threats this virus posed to the, you know, the world and the, and the UK population as the pandemic unfolded. I think it's regrettable how little international uh, political coordination there was in this pandemic, best represented in terms of the competition for vaccines. But there has been unprecedented scientific collaboration and openness, with the whole biomedical research field moving away from a get the paper into the New England Journal or Nature model to putting things on preprint servers in advance, which whilst that has been common practice in physics, for as you know, long as I've been working in science, it hasn't been common practice in biomedical research. I think the UK really did punch above its weight in research, and partly because um, Patrick Valance and Chris Whitty persuaded the government that it was worth spending a small percentage of the total cost of responding to this pandemic on getting the best information. So we did get a gold-plated surveillance system, and we ran some very key epidemiological and clinical studies for instance, on new treatments run out of Oxford, but involving many researchers around the country, we really led, led the world in those, in those studies. I would argue, of course, analysis and modeling has played an important role in the response, not just what we've been done in Imperial, by many groups across the UK and parallel groups across countries uh, around the world, in, in, in informing governments and giving better situational awareness for decision making. And one thing I could give a separate lecture on this, and we need to be re reflect on, is the pandemic really did exacerbate inequality, both within the UK and between um, global north and global south countries. The countries which have been most devastated economically by the pandemic are the poorest countries in the world. Supply chains were most affected, and, and those, many of those countries rely, for instance, on tourism as a main source of income, and that, of course, ceased during the pandemic. And with that, um, just a few acknowledgements and showing the RSC team again, I'll maybe take a couple of questions in the remaining five minutes. <laughs>
Um, you all have the code for Slido on um, the agenda for the session, so feel free to put some questions on here. I think I was told we can also take questions on the room. Thank you. Um, so thank you for the talk, uh, which was fascinating. Um, so at the Software Sustainability Institute for the last 12 years, we've been campaigning for the importance of software as this underpinning technology across you know, everything in life, mm -hmm. really. And um, we've been looking for a case study, and we've been arguing that something big's going to happen. At some stage, software is going to be our route out of it, our solution. And you became that case study that we never really wanted. Um, do you think that the pandemic has sort of focused minds in government about the important underpinning role of software across all of research and you know, hopefully the importance of good software engineering? I think it's focused minds in some bits of government and within aspects of the civil service. I would hesitate to think there are many cabinet ministers who stay awake at night worrying about it. But I was at a recent meeting at the Institute for Government which actually had somebody from the National Audit Office present, and certainly it's on their agenda to, so I should say there's academic software, but there's an enormous amount of software used within government, particularly in management of crises, much of which doesn't bear much inspection, but um, the, um, there's lots of, for instance, 100 megabyte Excel spreadsheets which run things which you'd be scared to learn about, but um, um, I think that has been recognized as a gap in terms of, first of all, auditing what's out there, auditing, you know, not quite getting to unit testing, but at least documenting that and, you know, the validation processes, training processes of staff using it. So I think there's a gradual improvement within government. Um, I would, it could certainly go faster. I don't think it's a top priority. So, question there. Yeah, very interesting talk. Thank you very much. Um, I'm, I was part of the team at EPFL Lausanne around Carmel Troncoso, who started this effort to have this uh, proximity tracing, which has then been uh, implemented as the oh, yeah. GAN protocol by Google and Apple. And um, one thing we saw what, that was really interesting was that we had kind of a solution, but then kind of the government uh, did not really try it out, did not, was not really behind, so they just said, okay, we have this thing, just try it out, but they did not really promote it, and uh, if I remember correctly, in the UK, it even went to the point where people complained that they needed to stay home all the time because the tool tells them, hey, you have probably been infected, and then, well, the, the, of course, the higher up said, we want to have our people working for us, and not staying at home, and uh, how, how can you help the government and, and uh, putting some uh, useful policies in place to actually say, okay, yeah, people have to stay at home, but that is the purpose of these tools. And uh, you, yeah, you, you I mean, so, so we did a little bit on this, but my colleague and friend Christoph Frazier in Oxford did a lot on both informing the development of that tool and analyzing the data coming out. So. Yeah, we all hated the, um, the COVID app and, and being told to stay home, but I mean, he's estimated it probably, it probably did save significant numbers of lives by, by just damping down transmission a bit. What it can't do is if once you get very high levels of infection in the population, there's a, there's a tipping point where such tools are not terribly useful. They basically ha tell nearly you know, a significant fraction of the population to stay home. Um, and, and you may as well adopt other measures at that point rather than you know, having you know, your entire workforce just pinged on an app. Um, where they're more useful is where infection levels are at a lower level. And so Singapore, for instance, and we work closely with Singapore, also use similar tools to much better effect because they kept infection levels low. And there, with the right sensitivity, those apps can be very useful at just damping down limited numbers of chains of transmission. But they were never really designed to cope with the situation we had in the summer of 2021 with very high levels of infection for many months on end. Yeah, they probably helped a little bit, but at that point, yeah, the, downside, the downsides were very apparent. Okay, I think we've got time for just one more question. I'm gonna take that top one from Slido. Uh, so what's the most important thing that uh, we could should do to prepare for the next pandemic in terms of improving research software to aid policy response? 
it's a difficult question to answer on the spot, but um, so I think one of the things, there has been enormous investment in developing a whole range of tools um, which have been applied across the world, um, but there isn't much in the way of standardization in terms of data formats, um, schema for metadata, in the same way that we have in genetic data where those data formats are much more standardized, I think moving to a more standardized way of collating, storing, and, and sharing epidemiological data would help because it would accelerate the adoption of, of a more standardized set of libraries, um, at least for the, the simpler analyses which every country would need to do in the case of a, a, a new outbreak. So I think there are trends in that direction, um, but certainly that, from a software perspective, that probably would be the single biggest thing because we'd just be able to hit the ground running much faster if, if those things were in place. And there are the what WHO hub, new uh, epidemic preparedness hub in Berlin, is, is kicking off an uh, initiative to attempt to accelerate that. And there are also things like data.org and global health, which are, are, are trying to push those initiative types of initiatives forward. Thank you very much, and for the fun time, Professor Neil Person. Thank you.